You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 319 of the podcast. And in this one, I interview Taylor Glenn Denning. Taylor has kindly agreed to share her story with us. And in particular, we discuss hit and run themed OCD, her other themes, including violence and harm. Taylor breaks down some of the compulsions she did. She shares a couple of stories to illustrate these themes and, and compulsions. We discuss her therapy journey, what she's learned in therapy, medication, the benefit of going to therapy multiple times a week for her, developing the skill of distress tolerance, words of hope, feeling shame, and much more. I really enjoyed hearing Taylor's story, and I hope you guys do too. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers affordable, effective, and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. So thank you, as always, to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Taylor. Welcome to the show, Taylor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. And uh, it'd be great to hear your OCD story. You can go into as little or as much detail as you want. Okay, awesome. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I actually think it's funny that I did reschedule for today because it's March 1st. And I was actually diagnosed with OCD March 1st, 2017. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. Nice. I was like, it's serendipitous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, that is, that is. Um, and did you know that when you rebooked it or was it just you realized as you were rebooked? I didn't realize until I got the rescheduling confirmation because when I rebooked, I just looked for the next available thing. Yeah. And then I got the email for March 1st and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, <laughs> what, good. how, uh, yeah, yeah, cool is that? Full circle moment. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, please, I'd love to hear your story. Yeah. Um, so, I actually got diagnosed pretty fast. I feel like, at least from what my therapist told me compared to most people, um, I think I had like a very triggering event in December of 2016 that I think like truly triggered the OCD. And then I started having intrusive thoughts about me harming other people. Um, So all of January, 2017, it was like, oh, like, you know, the normal checking the stove, checking the vents, um, the thermostat, because I was scared I was going to burn the apartments down that I lived in. Um, But at the time I only thought it was anxiety. Um, You know, I was, I graduated from college in 2017. My husband was applying to medical schools. I was like, I have a lot to be anxious about. Like that was the only feeling that I could compare it to. Um, But it just got more and more intense so quickly. Like I look back to January and February of that year and just going from, you know, needing just to make sure the oven and the stove is off to not being able to drive my car because I was scared of hitting people, um, to having to walk to campus and count my steps. And if I didn't count my steps, that meant I hurt someone. Mm -hmm. Um, I almost dropped out of college. Like I could barely function within like two months. And the thing that like, absolutely like set me off because everything else prior to the big thing for me, I just, attributed to anxiety because I was like, this is making me feel anxious. Um, but I, it was like the last week of February of 2017 and I went to the bathroom and I threw away a tampon and immediately I was like, what if that was a bomb? And I was on campus. And so that just like completely left me frozen. Like I was like, what if that was a bomb? (laughs) Um, So I convinced myself to leave the bathroom, but for about the next week, I would go back to that building every single day and check the trash, check the toilets. I would look on the internet for any news articles to make sure that building did not blow up. Um, And I don't remember why. I remember it was the last day in February 
And I was waiting to meet a group on campus um, to work on like a group project for class. And I was waiting outside one of the buildings and I was just obsessing about, I now refer to it as the tampon bomb, um, but I was just obsessing. And I was like, I cannot get this out of my head. I was so distressed. And to this day, I still have no idea why I Googled it, but I knew that, you know, OCD stood for obsessive compulsive disorder. I had no idea what it was, but because I was obsessing, I just happened to Google what is OCD. And the first thing that came up was a link to the IOCDF, which is the International OCD Foundation saying what is OCD and reading through that. Like I was, I started crying and I called my then boyfriend, now husband. And I was like, Ryan, like, I think I have OCD. (laughs) And he was like, what do you mean? Um, And it was like 4.55. And so I quickly call my doctor because I'm like, I need, like, I've had um, anxiety and depression my entire life. I've been in and out of therapy. So I'm like, very, I was like, I need to talk to someone about this. Um, I call and I'm just like in tears and the doctor's like, are like, is an emergency? I'm like, no, like, I just, I think I finally figured out what was wrong with me. Um, so I, she happens to have an uh, appointment available the next day at 8 a.m. And I was officially diagnosed uh, with OCD by her and a social worker. <laughs> so it happened so fast. And to this day, like, I still have zero idea why I was inclined to Google what is OCD, but I truly think like that moment saved my life, at least knowing what I was going through. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Um, It's amazing how sometimes, yeah, you don't know why you search something, but there's something in you telling you to do it. Yes. Not saying what that is, but there's something. Nothing. Nothing. Because just the behavior I was exhibiting was, you know, obsessing about Mm. this thought and this fear and that was the only thing that I knew that, you know, had obsessive in it. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Yeah. Okay. So with the, the initial trigger, the question that came to my mind, you don't have to go into it by the way, but Mm -hmm. I do have one question about it, which is, is it a trigger in the cases? Like some people say, I saw like a news story, which triggered me Mm and set it all off or was it a trauma? If that makes sense. Like a traumatic thing Um, that happened. I think, So what happened, like, I don't mind talking about it at all. Um, So I was, my husband and I were down at his parents for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I remember exactly where I was. Like, I remember the time of day Um, I was standing in their living room and my roommate at the time texted me. It was just the two of us. We shared an apartment and she texted me saying that she was going to, um, she had to move out in the new year. So, you know, this was Christmas time, new year, um, and that she would be finding a subletter. And my first thought, and I'd never really had thoughts like this before, but my first thought was, well, what if that person hides drugs in my room and then calls the cops on me and I get arrested? And as soon as that thought came in, I could not let it go Um, to the point where those like next few days, like, cause I was trying to figure out like what to do with like my parents. Cause I was just like, please like, like, let me move out of here because it truly felt like that was going to happen. Like this completely far-fetched scenario. Um, And it was so bad. And I was so distressed. My parents were like, we will just pay her half of the rent so you can stay there. And not knowingly like reassuring me, Mm. but it was just such a little thing that triggered it. But ever that I've talked with my therapist about like, when was that moment? And it was that for some reason. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing it. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, and another one, we, I haven't really expi- explicitly done, I don't think, an episode on what they call hit and run OCD. But obviously, oh, yes. Yeah. You, you, you <laughs> that talked... is still my biggest oh, um, okay. thing. Like even yeah. today, like, you know, obviously you obviously know OCD is not curable. Mm-hmm. I still have it. Um, hit and run OCD is my biggest I guess, obsession or like intrusive thought that has caused me the most distress. Like, and that was the hardest thing for me to get over. So I would love to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, please. So my question was literally just going to be like anything you want to say on it. Um, yeah. So now I have many people that experience this. Yes. <laughs> and it is not fun. Um, yeah. 
-hmm. in the slightest. So I went to college in a town called Bellingham, Washington. I went to Western Washington University. It's very Northwest, like 30 minutes from the Canadian border. It's wet and it rains. And in the winter, it's very dark. It's tons of mountains around. So it's very dark, very early. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and everyone, I don't know if you've ever been to the Pacific Northwest, but Mm -hmm. a lot of people here wear black all the time. Like it's always like black jackets, black leggings, black pants. So the combination of everyone wearing black in like very dark environment Mm -hmm. while driving was like the perfect (laughs) storm for OCD to fester. Um, I don't really remember exactly like there wasn't like a certain like this moment was when I like developed this intrusive thought. I just know it definitely developed sometime in January or February. And it was kind of it just kind of started with if I was driving near campus or Bellingham is a very walkable city, tons of bicyclists. So I'd be driving and it'd be like, well, what if I just hit that person? And of course, like the feelings that you get from that. It's like, Oh my gosh, like I need to go back and check. Mm -hmm. So I would go back. I would literally turn my car around and go and check and make sure that there was no one there. And then I would drive away feeling like, okay. And then I'd be like, well, what if I just hit someone right back then? Because I wasn't focusing because I was focusing on making sure I didn't hit someone Mm -hmm. previously. Um, So it got so bad that I would spend 30 minutes driving around in circles, checking, um, physically, I would be checking the road, checking the sidewalks. And then when I would park my car, when I finally got out of that cycle, I would check my car for evidence of hitting someone like blood, dent, hair, Mm. um, broken windshield. And then I would check like the news and like the local scanners to make sure there were no reported hit and runs. Um, so it, that so I used to love driving I would go on car rides like just drive myself around for like an hour like at least twice a week just to listen to music like to Mm -hmm. decompress um I stopped driving completely for over a year Mm -hmm. because of that fear um so yeah I, I think the biggest thing for me that I really struggled with like you know how you just kind of zone out and go in autopilot And it's like, well, what if I don't remember hitting someone? (laughs) So it's been super fun. (laughs) Yeah, that's true because you can, well, with anything you can zone out, but sometimes with driving. um, Yeah, where it's just like you're on autopilot, like your brain recognizes that a light is green, but you're not actively recognizing and being like, yes, that light is for sure green. You can drive through it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, good point. Um, So let's talk a bit about therapy um yes what was that like for you and I guess let's let's start with um maybe talking specifically about hit and run like how you worked with that first yeah so I originally saw a therapist who claimed that she treated OCD she did not okay um it got worse my OCD got worse um but then my husband and I after we graduated college moved out to Chicago And I don't know, Chicago has an amazing network and support area for OCD. So it truly the best place we could have gone. Mm. Um, And it was so bad. My parents had to find the therapist for me and like sprung her on me because I was so deep into OCD. Like I wouldn't even consider going to therapy because I was like, oh, this last therapist didn't help at all. So I started seeing that therapist. Her name is Jill. I started seeing her three times a week um, for about an hour and a half. (laughs) Um, I would say the hit and run OCD aspect of therapy definitely didn't come until later. Um, So I started seeing her in July of 2017. And I didn't start driving until... February, March of 2018. So it, it, it took a while um, because it almost felt like I kind of had to learn how to redo life again um, because OCD was so severe for me. Um, And I think a huge thing that my therapist and I focused on was me thinking that my thoughts have power 
to like make things happen and like put too much, I guess, like confidence in my thoughts. Um, so originally we worked on, okay, like if I believe that just because I had a thought about this thing and I believe that just because I had a thought and that happens, have a thought and like try to make something happen. And so my therapist, because, you know, my, my main thing like was the tampon bomb. She's like, okay, like think about blowing up the governor's house. And I was like, no, 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 like that way too distressing. And so it was at first literally like little tiny things, like sit across the room and try to make the light switch turn on Mm -hmm. with your brain, with your thoughts. If you believe that your thoughts have these, this power, um, do it. And so I loved therapy with her because she gave me a lot of things to work on outside of therapy. Um, So I had homework. So I remember sitting in my living room, trying to turn the light on and then trying to open the fridge and then trying to make an exit sign in the hallway fall on my husband's head. And just like, and then I remember in therapy, like, okay, try to make the lamp fall on my therapist's head. And so I think that Um, I guess exercise really helped me with distress tolerance as well. And realizing that my thoughts are literally just thoughts um, and that they don't have any power outside or um, can affect anything. I think that helped me overall grow with OCD um, in terms of recovery Um, I did try driving, I think it was in like August or September of, um, 2017, because that there, I was like making such huge strides. Like I was like, Oh my gosh, like, this is so cool. But I drove with my mom and we were on the freeway and she looked down at her phone to check a text message. And because she wasn't watching me and because she couldn't reassure me, I had a complete relapse in treatment, like didn't go back to zero, but went back to like too. Like we lost a lot of stuff. Um, so I think to build up to being able to tackle the hit and run OCD, it was really working on the smaller building blocks because even though they felt so much smaller and they did not cause me nearly as much distress as, um, the hit and run OCD did, it still mattered in terms of me recovering from OCD and having that toolkit and those building blocks to be able to sit with the discomfort and work through the um, emotions of when I eventually did start basically learning how to drive in a way again. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And, and when you, yeah. And what, yeah, thank you for explaining that. I think that, was, that was really good. And when you came to hit and run OCD, what were some of the exercises she asked you to do around that? Um, so a big thing was, gosh, and it sounds so silly and like it might not make sense, but I was living in a house at the time and it was literally just go walk around the block. Okay, so walk around the block, like kind of like just like imagine that you're driving. Mm-hmm. And I think one, me walking around the block by myself was a huge thing in itself because I couldn't even leave the house by myself at one point. So walking around the block, at least getting out near the road was so much more than I had been doing. Mm -hmm. So after that, um, then I would actually get into the car and turn it on and I would back it in and out of the driveway. (laughs) And then it would be okay. Once I felt comfortable with that, I'm going to drive around the block. But during all of this, I would have someone in the car with me, but I could not ask for reassurance and they could not give me reassurance. Um, Or at the very, very beginning, it was like, okay, every second time I ask, they can give me reassurance. And then the next day it'd be every third time. Cause like doing it cold Turkey just did not work for me. Like it sent me into that, like uh, distress. Um, And then it, just became, I learned to cope without even asking for that reassurance eventually. So I would have someone in the car with me drive around the block. Um, and then I kind of made like a huge jump. So I was driving around the block and at this time, so I had graduated college in June of 2017. I wasn't working because I, I couldn't, you know, go outside 
<laughs> I couldn't be by myself. I couldn't work. Um, I actually got a job at a bridal shop because I, I think I was just like, you know what? I, I need to work like just socially for myself. So I got a job at a bridal shop and the first few days, like my mom, my dad, or my husband, Ryan would drive me. And then one day, just out of the blue, I was like, I think I want to drive to work today. (laughs) Like this is from someone who, you know, spent the past year not driving and was only driving around the block with someone in the car and it required a freeway to get to work. So my mom came in the car with me and my dad followed behind. And I know that this is like tech, you know, a form of reassurance, but I drove, I drove myself to work. And then when we got there, my mom just went with my dad in the car, but that was the first time, you know, I'd actually driven. And then I did that a few more times and it gave me time to work with my coping skills too. Cause I absolutely had the intrusive yeah. thoughts. Like, and I wanted, you know, to sit at stoplights forever and be like, okay, like no one's going to, like, you know, and do all my checks and mm-hmm. stuff. And it was nice because I had, I do really well with like talking out my intrusive thoughts and what I'm feeling like. So it was really helpful for like my mom or like if my husband was available or even my dad to be able to be like, Hey, I am feeling this way right now. I just had this intrusive thought. I am just letting you know, and (laughs) we are just going to sit with it. Um, And then after a few days of that, I was like, you know, I think I want to drive by myself. Um, And so I still had the car following me, but I drove by myself. And then I think it was at least like two weeks of actually driving to work. I was like, you know, I, I think I want to try driving completely by myself. And I did. And I called my therapist when I got to work and she was like, what? Um, and I think, cause it was just like such a huge jump and it happened so fast for me, but I, I think I was ready. And I think I wasn't giving myself enough credit for like how much work I had put in with those smaller building blocks. Um, because I realized that I, I had more coping skills than I realized that I did. And because I had built been building my distress tolerance when the intrusive thoughts hit me while I was driving, they were not completely all encompassing that they had been before. So yeah, but I still do um, get intrusive thoughts like that. Like today, I it was raining. You know, I live in Washington. Um, it was raining and it was like, oh, like you were focusing on the rain and the cars coming. But what if there was someone crossing the street? And that, mm-hmm. one thing that has kind of become my motto and like my husband will say this to me anytime I'm like, oh, you know, just worried that I hit someone. And he's like, oh, well, I guess we'll see. And like yeah. inviting that doubt in because of my therapist and I had that heart to heart. She was like, do you want to live a life where you can try to get the 100% certainty, but you will live it the way that you currently are right now. Or you want to invite some doubt in and some uncertainty in, but you can live the life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) so my answer to everything OCD is like, well, I guess we'll see. Like, I guess we'll see if the cops and come arrest me for running over the person. But I think asking myself or telling myself that like, definitely helped too with the driving kind of like oh well we'll see (laughs) yeah Yeah, i like that that's that's a good um mantra or attitude or mindset um i I like and appreciate that you yeah you did talk about like scaffolding is how i'd call it like you you, if if this didn't work well let's dial back or what's the what's Mm -hmm. the smallest thing we could do first let's do that and then let's do a bigger thing but we add we, we don't take away all the compulsions. You can do a couple of them instead of four mm-hmm. of them. And then, exactly. and then we pull that back. And then, yeah. So that's... I, I think it's so easy to want to like go from, you know, zero to 100 so quick. Yeah. But sometimes taking and adding components can really help. And then one day you'll realize, oh, I don't need to add them anymore. And it's the coolest thing because you don't even realize like that that change has happened. Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, it sounds like you were putting a lot of effort in between sessions, like in your mm-hmm. homework. Just anything mm-hmm. you wanted to say about that, like how much 
time you spent on it how you structured it did you like put it in your calendar or was it more you just did it as and when or yeah it was more so as intrusive thoughts happened okay um I spent a lot of time alone obviously because I wasn't working my husband was in med school um and the reason my parents were there is because they moved in to our apartment complex because I could not take care of myself um so I was having intrusive thoughts every single hour of every single day. So that was basically, you know, I worked on them when they came and that's when, you know, they came. Um, Sometimes in like moments of relative calmness, because I I think I forget it now, like because my life is mine again. Mm -hmm. I think I forget how bad it really was um, and how all encompassing it was. And how little moments of like mental clarity I had. Um, so I think when I did have those moments, I think I, I made an effort to actually, like I had binders of like worksheets cause she would like print them from like OCD workbooks and stuff. Um, and I think that's when I would actually pull out the worksheets to mindfully work on it. And then when I was in the moments of distress or high emotions from intrusive thoughts. It would be more of like an on the fly thing. Obviously I would feel the emotions and sit with them, um, maybe cry a little bit, but then I'd be like, okay, like what have I learned that could help even a little bit in this situation? Okay. Let's, let's try a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I love that you ask yourself that question because I think, when we are distressed, we, it's hard. That part of our brain that can think logically, logically mm-hmm. isn't in control. So being able to ask yourself that question is a way to re-engage that part of the brain. And Exactly. And it also distracts you as well from those emotions. And exactly. I think that's helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, okay. So I guess, is there was there like a moment in your recovery journey where something just clicked and just made sense? either about OCD or about the therapy? So I, so like I said, I've had anxiety and depression for my entire life. I've been in therapy since I was like five years old. I love therapy so much. Um, And therapy was going great with Jill, my therapist. Um, But she had suggested when I first started seeing her medication Uh, And I had been on an antidepressant since I was 16 and I was 22 at the time. So like I was no stranger to medication, Mm -hmm. but I had had a bad um, reaction to one. And I, I think I was in such an emotionally heightened state that I was like, I can't handle um, this if there is a bad reaction. Um, So after I did try driving in, um, August or September. And I had that relapse and just seeing that I had worked really hard and that, uh, let's see, seeing that I'd worked really hard and that something happened and it just kind of like set me back. I think that moment was like, okay, therapy is working. Like it obviously is because I'm not set back to where I was like at my baseline. And I tried driving like that's huge. But I think at that time I was just like, if there is something else that can help me and my therapist knows me well, at this point, we have been spending many hours a week together. I will try this. So she referred me um, to a psychiatrist who I trust this woman with my life. Like I'm going to start crying. Like moving away from her was like one of the hardest things. Um, she specializes and takes special interest in women with OCD. Um, so I saw her, um, and she prescribed me the lowest dose of fluvoxamine and Luvox, you know, the OCD medication. And even that lowest dose just took the edge off for me to where like, I still absolutely felt (laughs) the emotions and like everything from the intrusive thoughts, but it also let in the logical side for me to where I could really think about all the tools I learned from therapy and actually apply them versus before for me, 
it felt like I would have an intrusive thought. I would get distressed. I would do a compulsion and it wouldn't, it would sometimes be in the moment, but sometimes it would be once I was coming down from that, where I would be able to engage the tools. But with the medication, it really helped me just not to be so over the top um, and really use those tools. And I think ever since I started that medication, that's really when it was just like a uphill climb. Mm -hmm. Um, There are obviously very still hard times and like there were absolutely intrusive thoughts that were very distressing, but it wasn't near the all encompassing um, total body, like brain, like cannot focus on a single thing. So I think accepting both of those forms of help was really like a turning point for me because I think I had convinced myself like, Oh no, I can work super, super hard and get on top of the OCD, which like, I absolutely think I absolutely could have, it just would have definitely taken a bit longer. But, um, I think the medication just kind of opened another door for me. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, Okay. So, uh, yeah, I guess a similar question, like any sticking points or roadblocks that got in your way and how did you overcome them? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, I think the biggest, I think roadblock that I have experienced is I think like was getting too comfortable with like starting to feel good. Okay. Um, and you know, not being on top of OCD all the time because it would creep back in Mm -hmm. Um, just little things that like, you know, they weren't super distressing. So it's like, Oh no, like that's fine. And then it would get more severe again. I'd be like, Oh, well now I have to work hard again to get this back under control. So I think like that was definitely a big thing for me, especially back in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, but even to this day, like, I still think that that can be like pretty mentally exhausting too. Um, but uh, not necessarily like I realize that I am incredibly privileged, um, to be able to have the access that I have had to therapy and to have parents who were able to like literally stop everything to take care of me. Um, and be able to go to therapy, you know, three times a week. Um, so once I was finally in therapy and had that support, besides obviously of how hard OCD is, um, it didn't feel like there were like too many like roadblocks, at least that stick out to me now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and what was my next question? I'm blanking. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Is there anything else uh, that helps you in your kind of, I say either recovery journey or just general mental well-being that you do? Mm-hmm. Um, well, yes. So I think, I think OCD has actually taught me a lot, like in terms of like dist- distress tolerance. Um, and so it's funny, like, and I, uh, so I actually have developed an eating disorder and I think it coincided when I was going through OCD treatment and I know OCD and eating disorders are very, can be yeah, can intertwined. Be, yeah. Um, and so many things that I have learned in OCD treatment are applicable in eating disorder treatment. Like, and I think this just helps in general with like anxiety, you know, the anxiety of the world. And you know, what's happening right now with Ukraine, Yeah, it yeah. can just feel like so much sometimes and like almost like overwhelming. And I think just being able to sit with that and not let it be anything more than just those feelings. I'm not sure if I'm describing it right because when I'm able to sit with those things and those feelings, they pass compared to, I guess, like me just like trying to like put them away or shove them away or like, Oh no, I don't want to feel that. I think, I guess just being able to 
deal with like stress and like the discomfort um, and accepting short-term discomfort has really helped me just, I guess, in so many areas of life. And I don't think I would know that without OCD um, treatment and my journey with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I guess, yeah. So, you know, the many people listen that have OCD. Um, Mm -hmm. So just words of hope, you know, for them, I guess, whatever stage they're at. Yeah. So I I think that was one of my biggest things when I was first diagnosed, I felt like the loneliest person Mm -hmm. on the planet. I did not know a single person who had OCD. I did not know a single person who had violence or harm OCD. Um, I, so one thing like I do tell, so I'm very like outspoken about this on social media. And so I was actually talking with a girl about this last week and she was like, you know, it's getting worse for me. And like, I feel so ashamed and embarrassed of these intrusive thoughts. And something that really helped me that my therapist told me was, there is not a single thought that you have had that another person has not had. And I know like that, like might seem super trivial and someone's like, okay, wow, like great. Like, (laughs) but that just helped me to not feel so alone. I think with a disorder that does feel very alienating Mm -hmm. Um, because I was like, there's no way people who aren't murderers, you know, have these thoughts of harm or, oh my gosh, when my uh, therapist told me about pedophilia OCD, (laughs) guess what my OCD latched onto that. Um, But I think just like knowing that you are not alone in those thoughts, even if they can feel so morally wrong or taboo. Um, And then I think also that it truly doesn't last forever. Um, Like I said, like today is five years since I was diagnosed and my OCD was so severe. Like why box? I was 39 out of 40. Like could not leave my apartment, couldn't be near the windows because I was scared I would yell something mean at someone. I was a prisoner in my own brain and my life felt like it had been taken away from me. And I truly, it was hard hard to see the future because OCD was just taking up so much um, of my present. And I think it would just be like that it, can get better and it will get better and that there is hope. Um, And I know that's cliche, but I didn't think that there was. Mm -hmm. And now I can drive my car again and I can do all the things that I want to do even while having OCD. Um, But I think like the biggest thing that I clung to, like in my worst times was hope as well. And hearing that other people were on the other side of it, even though, you know, I still have OCD, but that it did not control their life anymore. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I like that. And I think I like what you said about the thoughts. Um, and I think just to add to that, you know, culturally we, we put so much importance on how we mm-hmm. think and you shouldn't think bad things and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Really mm-hmm. what's important is our actions. It doesn't matter what we think. Exactly. So it's actually funny because my therapist, um, she worked at a maximum security prison yeah. with actual murderers mm. and pedophiles. <laughs> and she was like, it's so, she was like, it's so funny to work with OCD sufferers and then to just compare them to people who actually did these horrible things that, you know, OCD mm. sufferers are worried about because she was like, there is, she's just just the stark difference and like she's like no ocd sufferer has ever wanted to do these things or ever done any of these things and she was like and these people who committed these things um they were never once worried about doing them or if they did them and so i think that helped me too it's like i put so much importance and weight on my thoughts and what they meant and what they meant about my morals and about my character And it took me a very, very long time to realize that they are just thoughts and they do not inherently have any moral standing or meaning. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, it's an important distinction. Um, Once we realize it, that that helps. 
So yeah. um, what was I going to ask? Yeah, you, you've got a billboard in, in Washington State. What do you want written on that billboard? Um, <laughs> uh, OCD is not an adjective. Um, or, yeah, probably that, I yeah. think. And I know that's, like, very broad. Um, I think, one, that would get people to be like, oh, like, what do you, what do you mean it's not an adjective? Yeah. Um, cause I will admit it before I was diagnosed, I absolutely used OCD to, you know, one of my roommates was super clean and super particular. I would be like, oh my gosh, she's so OCD. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember seeing, I think I was still in high school, but I don't know if you remember, there was like this, um, sweater, Christmas sweater at target yeah. that said obsessive Christmas disorder. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing that and I was like, oh my gosh, like, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. And now that I have it and know people who have suffered from OCD. CD. I'm like, I am absolutely with that girl. Like, Mm. I don't think most people say I'm so OCD or use OCD incorrectly, maliciously at all. Like, I don't think there's any, you know, malicious intent, but words do matter Mm. and they do have impact and they can hurt people. Um, And I think, and I obviously don't take it personally, um, but it does hurt, you know, sometimes when you're just like, so you hear like an acquaintance, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so OCD about that. Like I could never. Yeah. And it just kind of feels like, you know, it's undermining the amount mm-hmm. of suffering that people with OCD have gone through and just kind of like plays it off as a quirk compared to a very serious mental disorder. Um, and something that people really struggle with. Yeah. So I think it would probably be um, OCD is not an adjective. I was at the vet and they had like a quirky sign with OCD on it. And I was just like, <sighs> I know you guys probably think that that's cute, but <laughs> I obviously didn't say anything cause I'm not confrontational at all, but I was just like, I think myself and others would appreciate if, you know, just recognition, you know, that OCD mm. isn't a quirky fun little personality trait. Um, and that I think using it so casually can also hurt OCD sufferers too, just because of the stereotypes of the clean and organized. It can, I think it can, um, also prevent people from like realizing that what they have is OCD. Yeah. Really really good point. Um, uh, so yeah, you pick up the phone and call the 20 year old Taylor. What do you tell her? (laughs) Oh gosh, I, (laughs) um, I would tell her that one, it's going to be okay. Like it it truly is. And I know a lot of people say that, but it will actually be okay. I tell her that she would go through hard things that she never thought she would have to go through and be in a place that she never thought she'd be in but that she would also be on the other side of that one day too. I think I would say that she would realize like she's a lot stronger than she thinks she is Mm -hmm. and that she has, she would eventually have an appreciation for life that I don't think I ever had before. Um, My cousin got married this past summer and I hadn't seen her since before I was diagnosed with OCD And she looked at me, she was like, I don't like, she's like, okay, what happened? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you used to be so shy. And I used to be so shy, like never trying new things, just happy, not necessarily happy, content to exist. Um, And I think with OCD taking my life away, I, I feel like people think I'm like exaggerating when I say that, but it took away my life as I knew it. Like I was a shell of who I was. And I think gaining that back has just made me so appreciative and just like, I guess not want to miss anymore, not in terms of like, you know, FOMO or anything, but just, I don't want to miss out on anything that I want to do. And I I think like it has just made me much more confident in myself. Like I believe in myself now and 
I'm nicer to myself now. I have way more compassion for myself and for others now. So I would tell her that like, (laughs) she's going to go through a lot, but I think she would be very proud of the person that I am today. Nice. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Uh, And yeah, lastly, you know, is there anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? Um, I feel like I like covered most of my main talking points, you know, that I normally talk about. Um, I think just like my biggest thing is when talking like, I guess about the um, conversation around OCD, I think at least for me, it's important to talk about all, or at least recognize like the entire range of like, you know, intrusive thoughts that there can be. Um, I think because like back to the morally and socially taboo things that prevented me from talking about the harm stuff for a very long time. Like I didn't talk about the tampon bomb Mm -hmm. for quite a while until I was at least comfortable with Jill, my therapist. Um, but it would also be to like recognize that there is, I guess, just like so much more than that too. And like more than we might not like might be able to recognize. Um, like my therapist was like, you know, it can literally be anything like Mm -hmm. that your brain subconsciously picks up on. Um, I went to the uh, OCD, um, conference. They have them every year. I went in 2018 in Washington, DC, and there was a panel of people talking and someone was talking about, Um, how they have intrusive thoughts about incest. Like, are they sexually attracted to their brother or their mother? And I was just like flabbergasted in a way because that had never occurred to me that that could actually be, you know, an intrusive thought because I'd never, you know, really heard anyone talk about it. And I think by, you know, not talking about it, whether it's due to, you know, like shame, like I felt a lot of shame um, or just embarrassment or I get some people just don't obviously want to talk about it. Um, but I think by not talking about it, I guess what I'm trying to say is just, I think talking about these taboo things makes it easier to talk about and makes it more known that literally OCD can latch on to anything. And that does not say anything about you as a person or what you want to do or what you're going to act on. And I think that yes okay <laughs> collecting my thoughts i'm like scatterbrained about this because i just feel like so many angles of the taboo topics mm-hmm. because when you're trying to talk to someone without ocd or who doesn't know what ocd is and you tell them these things that are socially taboo they're like oh my gosh like wait like you want to do that oh my gosh like you're sick you're weird like I guess just, I I just want to talk about, I guess, make those things more well known so that people don't hide and not seek help and feel embarrassed and ashamed Um, because I did for so long. And I I think back about to the pedophilia OCD thoughts and Mm -hmm. that felt like, and that was only like a very short but you know that I feel like that kind of felt fell under the umbrella of harm for me because I just never wanted to harm a single thing. Yeah. Um, and I I am so I'm very open about my intrusive thoughts and the content, but with that, I still feel like so much shame about. And so I think just like what just those things not being talked about as much. Um yeah, I <laughs> not sure where I was going with that. No, no, but, I, yeah. I, I like that. Um, and yeah, like you said, you know, shame can't exist in the dark. So the more you share it, the, the weaker. Yes, it gets. that um, is basically where yeah. that uh, <laughs> train of consciousness was trying to. No, it, get was, to. it was it was really good. There was another um, therapist on the show once said that OCD doesn't. It, it's not a, a a representation of what you want or what you want to do. All it is mm-hmm. is a representation of what you fear. So mm-hmm. you, you yeah. feared harming people, or causing exactly. harm. So that's why your brain yeah. kept throwing this at you. Yes, and that's yeah. exactly because I'm like, 
why else would I feel so much distress about this? You know, if I wanted to do this, why would I feel, yeah. you know, distressed about it? Yeah. But I, I absolutely love that shame cannot exist in the dark. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Nice. Look, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yes. I really enjoyed it. Thank hearing. you so much. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you having this platform and talking just to so many people within the OCD community, whether it's sufferers therapists researchers it just Mm. it's really awesome just to hear so many different aspects of the same topic that you know affects so many people thank you for listening to this week's podcast if you enjoy the ocd stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation please go to the ocdstories.com forward slash support All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.